And in this video, we're going to continue on with the different ecosystems of the world. So we're still um, going to describe characteristic biotic and abiotic components. But in this time, we're going to be looking at the aquatic ecosystems. Now, if you remember, what aquatic means is just simply that it has to do with water. So it's in water or permanently or most of the time in water. So aquatic biomes are ones that are water-based and are classified based on the amount of salt in the water. So salt is the abiotic factor that kind of contributes and determines what actually the biome is. So there's three different types of freshwater situations we can have. Rivers and streams, lakes and ponds, and then wetlands. In the marine, we have oceans and we have estuaries. And we'll talk about estuaries, estuaries a little bit later. But estuaries are simply just where salt and fresh water actually mix and form a brackish water. Now, the open ocean um, is kind of the one that everybody thinks of. The open, open ocean is when we start to move away from the coast, uh, we start to get into these very deep, very salty waters. And as we are moving away from the coast, the there's less available nutrients available and it decreases very rapidly. So nutrients in the open ocean are actually our limited factor. Now the open ocean is sometimes referred to as the marine desert. And the reason for this is the ocean is actually lacking a lot of life. There's actually not that many living things per square area in the ocean. Animals found in the open oceans are very mobile and they have to travel great distances in order to get their food. Now, when we go to the open ocean, it's kind of characterized by three different zones. We have the photic zone, and photic, I always think of photo as in light. So the photic zone contains sufficient sunlight for photosynthesis. So this right here would be the photic zone. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of sunlight in there. There's a lot of living things. This is also where most of the nutrients are found. Now, the aphotic zone also known as the bathyal zone, contains little or no sunlight. So it does have some sunlight, therefore it has some living things. But again, the amount of sunlight is drastically decreasing. And then finally, we have the benthic zone, or the abyss. And the, this is the bottom of the ocean. There's actually no sunlight that can actually penetrate this far down. So you're probably asking, well, how does the bottom of the ocean get nutrients? Now, remember chemotrophs, where that actually make their energy from chemicals, this is where a lot of them live, and they get their chemicals from sulfur in volcanic vents. So again, photic zone, where most of the light is, most of the animals. A photic zone contains little to no sunlight. Again, this is where the animals dive down during the daytime so they're not exposed to get eaten. Benthic zone is the bottom, very few, very weird animals down there. Now, food webs in the, the benthic zone, or the bottom, are much different because their source of energy is not sunlight. Like I said, there's no autotrophs down there because there's no sunlight. But in other words, the energy that gets down there is actually dead matter that sinks from above layers. So as things die, it kind of sinks down to the bottom. Okay, this is what we refer to as marine snow because those dead particles are actually beginning to float down. Or we have some chemotrophs down at the bottom as well. Now, coral reefs are one of the biggest and most productive ecosystems we have in the ocean. A coral reef, what that is referring to is a ridge of rock in the sea formed by the growth and deposits of coral. So here's a coral reef down here. All these different colorful structures are corals. Now, how those corals get there is they were at one time a polyp. And coral polyps are small animals that live in warm coastal waters of the tropics and subtropics. And what, and what coral polyps are is they have a mutualistic relationship between photosynthetic algae. Now, as the polyps grow, they start to produce this calcium-based external skeleton. When the polyps die, the skeletons are left behind, so other polyps can colonize on it. And this is how the coral reef grows. Now, one of the common threats that we're actually seeing to coral reefs is what's known as coral bleaching. And this is where the water either gets too acidic or too warm, and the photosynthetic algae actually dies or is expelled from these polyps, and it loses its colors and turns white, which is why we call it coral bleaching. 
Now, over time, these network of crevices and ledges creates this coral reef. And coral reefs are ideal habitat for a wide variety of fish and other marine animals. Now, coral reefs are the most diverse and productive ecosystems in the ocean. The coral reefs are kind of like the tropical rainforest of uh, the terrestrial biomes. So coral reefs have all these different types of fish, all these different types of plants, and all of these different animals creates one of the biggest biodiversities that we have in the ocean. Now, we also have freshwater sources. Rivers and streams are the two big freshwater sources that we have that are moving. So streams are much narrower, and they're narrow channels of water often that begin in mountainous areas. And again, this is where the water from melting snow or from glaciers moves rapidly across rock down waterfalls. So again, usually in streams, we get these big waterfalls like you see here, like Angel Falls in Bolivia. Now, rivers are formed when streams actually combine. So they merge together. And they merge together with runoff from water from their surrounding lands. And they now get bigger, wider, and deeper. More water in a particular area. Now, one of the most actually important um, freshwater uh, biomes that we have are actually wetlands. And wetlands, they're located away from coastal areas. Uh, they're actually called something different when they're in the coast. But inland wetlands are non-permanent bodies of water. But when it does rain or there is a little bit of water, it does get soggy pretty quickly. So we have a couple different types. Marshes are ones that don't have trees. Swamps do have trees. The way I always tell my students to remember this is, if you think about it, Shrek... If you ever watch that movie, Shrek lives in a swamp, and when he opens up his door, all you see is trees. So when Shrek says, get out of my swamp, he's being actually biologically correct because he lives in a wet area with trees. Now, bogs are a little bit different. Bogs are wetlands characterized by plants that produce an acidic secretion. And this acidic secretion slows down the action of decomposition. So um, bogs actually store carbon very rapidly because there is no decomp uh, decomposition to put it back in the atmosphere. Now, estuaries are where um, seawater mixes with freshwater. And estuaries are actually very important in terms of where fish actually reproduce. So, estuaries, there are also many different varieties. So, remember, uh, estuaries, fresh and salt water mix. Again, that's kind of important there to realize because what this does is it actually makes the water less harsh. And it's a perfect area for fish to actually have their young because it's protected as well as less harsh than the open ocean. Now, there are also many varieties of coastal wetlands, areas of land that are fully saturated with water at least part of the year has to do with the rising tides. So we have salt marshes, seagrass beds, as well as mangrove forests, which are all part of the wetland community. So there are some big benefits with wetlands. First of all, wetlands are highly productive ecosystems that support a great deal of biodiversity. There's a lot of different animals that actually live here, and plants as well. They can also slow and hold influxes of water. And why this is important is wetlands actually will prevent flooding. So when it rains very rapidly, there's a lot of water, the wetlands will actually soak up that water like a sponge and prevent it from going down and actually flooding different locations. So they are very important. Wetlands also have the ability to filter out or clean. Water that uh, passes through these wetlands tends to become cleaner and they have less sediment and less pollution. So these three things are actually why wetlands are protected areas in the United States. If you actually build, a wet, uh, build over a wetland, you're actually responsible for replacing three times the amount of wetlands in that area. So again, these are aquatic ecosystems, aquatic biomes. Hopefully this helps you out. Remember, this is the second part of your biomes thing for the ecology chapter. Hopefully this